All right. So in the last study, so this is now that you know some of the data from the molecular biology, let's talk about some practical aspects. And this is where you as uh, bioengineers can maybe think about what are the things that you could do here. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about what's currently on the market, the state of the research, um, what's going on, what needs to be figured out. You can take it from there. Okay, so first off, let's talk about some drugs. How many of you have heard of this drug, resveratrol? All right, a lot of hands go up, right? It's found in uh, red wine, right? And it, it does extend life. Why is this missing? Another slide missing. Jesus. Hold on. Try to uh, try to find it. Oh, the image cannot be displayed. Not enough memory to open the image. Well, that sucks. All right. Well, it's this paper called Witterall from uh, Nature, and what it showed was that. If you have a resveratrol and you have those growth curves in, in, um, in C. elegans, you add about 100 micromolar of resveratrol, the worm lives about, uh, about a week longer. Okay? That's, I would just sum it up for you right there. Um, and so that, those are the seminal studies in 2004 that showed that, hey, resveratrol does extend lifespan in worms. Um, just to let you know, the concentration that they use in the worms would be the equivalent, and because this resveratrol is found in red wine, of drinking 32 glasses of red wine. Not something you really want to do. A day. So that's why you probably don't want to do that because that probably has other ill effects in your health. Um, they actually, you know, took res this resveratrol, it's an antioxidant, and made it in pill form that you could t take. Oh, you know, so this came out in, like, I think in the mid 2000s. Like, take this pill, you'll, you know, it's this chemically proven thing to uh, reduce aging or, like, to slow the effects of aging, right? Yes, so this came out, I think, 2007, three years after the study, something like that. Um, not 100% sure, but it's basically it's a dietary supplement. Um, now, here's the thing, interesting thing. So you, in order to say certain things, you have to go through the FDA for approval. But you could say this is just a natural supplement, and that doesn't have to go through it, FDA, FDA approval. You don't have to, if you want to say it's proven to do this, it has to go through FDA. But you could say, like, we want to release fish oil and you just say it's a natural supplement. If you don't say and make any health claims, you can release that without any FDA regulation. So that's the thing. If you look, if you do look at supplements, nature and uh, natural supplements, read what it says in the bottle. See what it says. It's like FDA approved for this. If it doesn't say anything like that, it hasn't gone through the FDA. All right. Here's the problem with that. So the original study showed that it was through regulations of sirtuins. These are proteins on the pathway that affect autophagy. There was a follow-up study in 2011 which actually showed that sirtuins don't have anything to do with, res with how a resveratrol affects aging. And so how they did that was they basically took the lines that were used in the study and generated uh, overexpression of sirtuin, right? And you think the overexpression of sirtuin would um, replicate the effects of resveratrol, right? And in this particular line that they used in the previous study, that's the case. You overexpress your two ends, you get an increase in longevity. And again, increasing quality of life. Problem with that is that they took this line that was used in the original study, outcrossed it, which means they crossed it with other, um, uh, other breeds of worm to make sure that it wasn't just something else genetically in that line that was causing this. And when they did that, and they had that same sirtuin overexpression, that aging effect went away. So that tells you that sirtuins aren't the cause of this aging. So um, resveratrol is not operating through overregulation of sirtuins, or like um, increased expression of sirtuins. Resveratrol is probably operating through another mechanism that was in the background of this string that we just can't figure out, haven't figured out yet. Right, so it's not like that resveratrol doesn't, isn't something that you can take or something like that, but it's just that the mechanism now. So this is, was under FDA approval, has been since revoked because now they don't know the mechanism. Okay. Other organisms. Okay, this is rep repromycin. This is a, um, again, search can't show anything, can it? Again, another display. Okay. 
again, look on the slides. These are this is another study where they did this. I think this is time again in um, mice, where they basically had males and females that fed him rapamycin, and the mice that had rapamycin lived longer in general. Okay, not a ton longer, but it's statistically significant. Like maybe a couple of weeks longer, which in the lifespan of a mouse, which lives two years, is not that much longer. However, this is interesting because it, it's it was originally used as an organ transplant um, immunosuppressant. So it was used for one purpose, and they found that because it in, inhibits inflammation, you know, one of the problems of aging, that it actually has an effect in, in, in beneficially extending your in lifespan in mice. Um, of course, it has itself side effects. If you're inhibiting this mTOR, um, it's actually um, could have some side effects of in, insulin resistance and glucose intolerance. And so I'm going to go back to that um, effect on autophagy. So rapamycin, this molecule here, that affects this thing. This is called literally the target of rapamycin. That's the name of the complex. Um, so it was originally found to like this is what the drug affects. And this complex of proteins um, will negatively regulate autophagy. The mechanisms so far no one's really been able to figure out. Right. So if you repress this, you you uh, not only decrease inflammation, but you also Increase autophagy because you're removing a lot of the restrictions on it. You're removing a lot of the inhibition. Okay. Other drugs. Spermidine. This is a natural molecule up there. It declines during aging. And if you supplement, um, see that this is a sec again, study in C. elegans, you can actually extend your life. And this is dependent on BEC1. This is one of those proteins that was in the, in the downstream cascade. And so this is uh, studies that it does extend life in worms, flies, and mice. There are studies, hopefully, in the future, coming in in, in other advanced organisms. Okay. So this is something that's in the works, has probably reached preliminary clinical, preclinical stage studies. OK, and then there's caloric restriction. So this is um, basically um, studies have shown in or in flies, mice, anything that you can control calorie restrictions, that if you reduce calories to 60 to 80 percent of the calories that you would normally want with an optimal nutrition, which means your other nutritional requirements are exactly the same, right? So you, your percentages of fat, sodium, everything else is the same. But if you reduce the calories to 60 to 80 percent of your recommended level, um, this has actually been proven to improve lifespan slow aging in mice. And there's these current studies. Um, called the calorie studies, which are being done at Duke, which had an initial study in 2006. And I'll show you the results from that. And they're under, currently undergoing a follow-up study with more with increased numbers to show if this is the case in, in humans. And so those results aren't out yet. They'll hopefully be out this year. Yes? So that's interesting. I'll get some follow-up studies that show that. Okay, so. So the initial study just followed 48 healthy adults for six months. OK, so it's not juveniles, not teenagers, adults. And actually, this is interesting because the recruitment process had, like in order to get those 48 people, you had to go through about 600 people. I mean, so that's actually a ton of work to go through this kind of clinical trial, where you basically, OK, from these about 600 people, a lot of people were ruled out ineligible. And you basically had 48 adults that you randomized for six months. And you assign them to different groups, right? So 12 people assigned to a weight maintenance group. Keep, keep your same diet, keep everything, make sure your weight's the same in six months. Uh, 12 assigned to caloric restriction, just caloric restriction. 12 assigned to caloric restriction with an exercise regimen. Right? And then 12 assigned to a very, like a, like a traditional like crash diet group. Okay, See what the effect's on there. Um, and then. This is kind of the results, results you see. So this is, first off, is the weight changing in percentages and kilograms. And you see, obviously, the very low calorie diet, if you're going to keep this up for six months, does result in a massive weight loss. Right? Um, same thing with but the caloric restriction versus exercise also does that. Much slower, not a crash. Right? As far as health benefits, with 12 people in each group, the numbers are kind of mixed. Right? So this is. Change in your glucose levels, change in your insulin levels. And there's really not much difference before a change at month three versus month six for any of these groups. 
nothing is really outside of the statistical noise. Again, with 12 people per, per batch, it's kind of hard to actually parse that. All right? um, there might be some decrease in insulin levels for people who are undergoing diets or caloric restriction. It's kind of hard to tell. All right? um, this also could be a decrease in DNA damage. Again, hard to tell. Well, what about some non-human studies? Because they're doing this right now in humans. They actually did an interesting study in rhesus monkeys. All right, so first study in 2006 found that caloric restriction did have an effect. Fewer of the, of the caloric restriction group died than the, than the control group. However, this was a flawed study because two things. One, it was a very unhealthy diet that the monkeys were fed with in general. It a sucrose percentage. So this, is, this, this study had about 30% glucose. This follow-up study had about 30% glucose. Right. And then also, the, even though the, the calories were regulated, <coughs> the rhesus monkeys were allowed, in the previous study, to basically eat the, the portion size control. So the, you, you didn't control portion size in this first study. So they did a follow-up study where, yes? <coughs> you give them a fixed amount of food, you let them eat whenever they want. Yeah. Yeah, you basically give them the food and they eat what they want. Instead of you actually like monitor their feeding times and like you know only set out X number of food for a certain time. So that's more like regulated versus just um, self-regulating your portions. You just put out their food for the day and they they eat whatever they want whenever they want. That's obviously a little bit harder to tell what's going on there. So in this study, they did two groups of monkeys. Okay, the first group was thirty-seven. Older monkeys, so these are uh, monkeys that are aged 16 to 23 when they started that study. And just to you know, give you some perspective, the average lifespan of a monkey is about 30 to 40 years old. So these are adult monkeys that they put on this uh, diet for many years. See what happens. Um, it's also kind of a bit nuanced. Um, first thing is that you see is that the survival rate curves for these um, for caloric restriction monkeys versus normal monkeys for male and female, not much different. Males tend to live longer than females anyway in the, in the species, and the caloric restriction doesn't really change that. Some health indicators are a little bit better, though. So, for example, if you're uh, a male rhesus monkey, you find that as you, uh, if you're a caloric restriction, your uh, cholesterol levels go down and stay, uh, and stay down. So that's good for you. If you're a female, it doesn't really change that much. Doesn't, it, it still goes up. It's still lower than if you don't have caloric restriction, but it doesn't change that much. And then the other thing you see is that the triglycerides for these go, um, increase. I hard to tell. I'm sorry. Sorry, the tri triglycerides uh, drop. So sorry, it's, it's hard to read. The red, either dash or straight, is the caloric restriction, male and female. And the blue dash is, or straight is the controls. Not really well marked as far as the graph is concerned. Um, but what you can, so the two talking points here is that your tri triglycerides for both males and females, rhesus monkeys go down. And if you're a male, your cholesterol level goes down. If you're a female, not much of a change. Okay? Um, and they did the same thing for a bunch of young and juvenile rhesus monkeys, so about 80 of those, ages 5 through 12. And they put them through this study. And this, is, this has been going on for about 15, 20 years right now. So they're all around their 30s and stuff like that, right? Their 20s and 30s. So again, it's kind of hard to tell the survival curves because a lot of them haven't died yet, right? So like about over, over half of these monkeys are alive. It's kind of hard to tell the survival curves at that point. And as far as the other effects, kind of hard to tell what's going on with the glucose and triglycerides. It doesn't seem to have much of an effect right now. But again, they're halfway through the study in the young monkeys. The old monkeys have all died by now, so they, that's why they released this paper. So what other things can you say about this? Well, this is a, 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 a follow-up figure where they basically calculate when these, each monkey is diagnosed with a particular disease. So neoplasia is basically when tumors form, so cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And what they found here is very interesting is that um, not much difference in cardiovascular disease between the control versus calorie restrictions, and the ages where they get these diseases. Um, but this is interesting. The young monkeys, none of them have cancer yet. Whereas a lot of, you see in the controls, a lot of them have developed cancers already. 
So there's some interesting results there. And they did the kind of uh, calculate the proportion of the monkeys with an age-related disease, either any one of these diseases. Um, and you see that the caloric restriction group has fewer monkeys with age-related diseases than the control group. However, this um, is not statistically significant yet. So the p-value is like 0.06 to give you an idea. So there seems to be some effect, but you can't really call it statistically significant yet. Again, this study is still ongoing. So things that were like 100% like, bam, this is really great evidence in mice, this is great evidence in worms and flies. When you get to something like recent monkeys or humans, kind of harder to parse. And that's where we're at right now as far as the research. Like, how do you really design effective protocols for, for advanced organisms? How do you do a clinical trial that makes sense? Right, so this is stuff that's been really well studied in, in the lower organisms, but once we get it to something closer to us, it becomes a little bit harder. Another interesting ongoing research is the last slide where, again, we're still undergoing some human caloric restriction studies to figure out what's going on there. Um, but there's other interesting things that um, I want to mention. So this paper came out really recently. It's really interesting. This is kind of a little grisly when I say this. It's like vampirism. Like Literally, they're taking blood from young animals, spinning it down, and putting in old an older animals. And I think this is in mice. And they showed that, hey, this actually helps the older, um, older mice to like, you know, cognate better. All right? So there is something to be said about younger blood. I don't know. Grizzly a little bit, but you know, like this is interesting to think about, right? That like the components in your blood actually affect your um, affect age. And then this one's an interesting one. So um, this was a 2002 study. So I don't know how many of you know. One reason aging happens is that um, the telomeres on your cells shorten with each DNA replication. So the more DNA replication you have with a, a non-stem cell, the uh, and the more cell divisions you have, the shorter your telomeres but get and to the point where your telomeres basically um, are so short they can't you can't undergo around DNA replication after that and that's when your cells basically uh, undergo apoptosis so that's the common belief this paper is interesting because it basically showed that this is not actually the case in a lot of cells a lot of cells actually the telomeres do shorten but your your machine machine senses that and actually has a protein complex which comes in and caps the cells and prevents that from being shortened and prevents the DNA from, from in there. So this is, again, replicative senescence, right? Senescence, as, as Shamik mentioned earlier, where it's not like there's a